Father. City. My name is Daryl Shamby. I have the honor and the privilege to present our announcements today. First up, the city's next baptismal service will be held on Wednesday, 
November the 28th at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. If you are interested in getting baptized, please sign up online or at our church website, or also you can call our church office. Next, join our, wing, our rings ministry for a date night, fun night of fellowship. And all the married people said, and all the single people said, amen, hallelujah. It's a fellowship night with bowling at the bowling alley on MCRD. It happens on Friday, November the 30th at 6.30 p.m. This is open to both singles and couples, and it only costs $10 per person. To RSVP and for other important base access information, please visit our church website at www.thecityonline.org or you can email rings at thecityonline.org. And last but not least, we'd like to send out a special thank you, gratitude for all of our veterans. Amen. We know our nation celebrates it officially tomorrow, but today is Veterans Day. We thank you for your service, not only to our country, but your sacrifice to the family, um, the discipline of military service life bleeds through all of us who are affected those who are family members and those who have served, we thank you. We thank you for answering the call, for saying, Lord, send me, for standing in the gap. We thank you. We appreciate you on this Veterans Day. And now, without any further ado, I'd like to turn the service into the hands of Pastor Erica Park. Let us put our hands together as she comes. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? I get excited when it's time to fellowship with my saints. I'm so honored and happy to be here today. It is offering time. Amen. Amen. This is opportunity that we can give. We can sow seed into the house of the Lord. You know, I know during this time, it's the holiday season and it's the end of the year. And I know we kind of get funny about our money, but I was reminded that that God will supply all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So we cannot and we have no reason to be afraid when it comes to money. It has, we have no reason to be afraid to give as our heart is moved to give because God will take care of everything that you need. And I'm a witness. I'm a witness that if you are faithful and you trust in the Lord, that he will bless you, he will cover you, he will provide opportunities for you. Just being faithful in your giving, just if being faithful in the way that you handle his money, because remember, it's his first. He gives us all the ways that we can earn money through our jobs and retirement, social security, investments, and all those things. That's all because of him. And when we are faithful and we are good stewards of his money, he covers everything that we need. So I want you, I want you to be led by the spirit in your giving and don't be afraid. Stand on his word, trust in his word and what he says about what he will do with giving. I can tell you so many scriptures and I believe every single one of them because I've seen them happen in my life. He can do it for you. Amen. So when you are ready to give, I want you to stand all over this building as a sign that you're ready. Where are all my tithers at? Make some noise. Yes. And those who give, those who have the desire but do not have it today, to stand in faith that the next opportunity that you get, you will give and you will have a seed to give. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and wave those offerings into the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And we have various ways that you can give. You see some people waving their, their phones. We can give online and we can give text and we can give push pay, we can give cash, and we can give check. But whatever way you give, make sure that you give unto the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you can repeat after me, I'm a tither and a giver. I'm blessed beyond measure. I have more than enough, and I'm living in my overflow. We're going to say that again with great conviction. I'm a tither and a giver. I'm blessed beyond measure. I have more than enough, 
and I'm living and I'm living in my overflow so father we thank you for every single gift oh god we thank you for every single person who is giving oh god by faith oh god lord we stand on your word and we believe in your word so god do what only you can do with our gift oh god lord multiply it oh god so there will be a blessing unto this church and to this community oh god we love you and we thank you oh god and even for the one who was not able to give oh god i pray oh god that you would give an opportunity real quick oh god give jobs and give opportunities for money to flow in so that they can be a blessing unto the house. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are under the instructions of the ushers and also our wonderful praise and worship team. Praise the Lord.
Hallelujah. Can we do what we just heard in the song? Can we do what we just heard in the song? Can we thank him in the room? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we love you. God, we adore you. God, we thank you. And we bless you for your presence being in this place. Father, speak to us now. Cause a paradigm shift to take place. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I need you to greet five people around you. Find five people around you. Say, I'm glad to be in worship with you. Five people. If you can't find five people, move closer. There's five people around you somewhere. Five people. Amen. It's good to see you this morning. I've got some good news for us, church family. We're, we're a community of faith, and we believe in crying with those who are crying and rejoicing with those who are rejoicing. And Elder Valerie is leaving. I said it was good news. <laughs> you know, she is getting married to the gentleman right next to her, Brother Eric Robertson. Or Roberts. Sorry, I didn't. I had a son on the end. It's with Robert. See. I, I told it. You said that's later? Is that what you said? The sun is later? I'm joking. I'm just joking about that. Come on, Sarah. <laughs> Amen. So she will be getting married next year. All right? So she's not leaving right away, but we are excited about this new season in your life. You have been faithful. And the Bible says he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we're excited about the addition to our family. Amen. Amen. All right, grab your Bibles. It's time for the word. Grab your Bibles. Go to John chapter 11. John 11. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. Everybody say, heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now then he had said these things. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with with a cloth Jesus said to him to them loose him and let him go then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen these things Jesus did believed in him I like to speak for a little while alternate endings if you can find four people and say alternate ending alternate ending alternate ending who needs an alternate ending in their life like your story seems like it's been repeating the same thing and you need something different to show up I need an alternate ending God speak to us cause a shift to take place and we give you the glory for it now in Jesus name amen Anybody seen the movie Get Out? Wave at me if you've seen Get Out. All right, good. So anybody that hasn't seen it, it'll be on TNT soon enough. Or go get the DVD. Uh, 
Get Out came out a little while ago. It was last year. And anybody seen the alternate ending? So you know in the original movie, Chris, who is the black guy, they're trying to take his, his consciousness and put it in someone else. He uh, ends up getting away from the family. And the very last scene, you find him standing over his girlfriend, Rose, who kind of started the whole thing. And a car drives up, and there's sirens going. And who jumps out the car? His friend, Rod, right? Rod drops out the car, grabs him, they get in the car. And he, you know, Chris asked Rod, how did you find me? He said, I'm TSA. And that's what TSA does. Hey, man, I can't use the language that's in there, so go watch it. But it's absolutely hilarious. Because anybody who knows who's been flying knows what TSA does. Drives me crazy. Sir, you still have a belt on. I forgot about the belt, sir. Um, so, so, so Rod jumps out, but in the alternate ending, if you get the DVD, anybody know what DVDs, the, the whole hook to get you to buy them is they have deleted scenes and alternate endings on there. And in the original adaptation of the script, the director says this, the director said that originally the alternate ending was the main thing, but because of the climate of society at the time, I couldn't put it out. The alternate ending goes like this, uh, Chris is standing over Rose and the car drives out. And someone jumps out the car, it's not his friend, it's the authorities. And the authorities grab him and do what the authorities do with the black male. They put him up against the car, based on the climate of the movie, they put him up against the car, and the next thing you find him, he's in prison, and he's holding the phone, and he's talking to Rod. And Rod is saying, man, can you remember? And Chris is saying, I, I really can't, I can't remember, I, I can't remember and Chris says, I just had to end it. And then Chris walks away, incarcerated. That's the alternate ending. That's the, that's the original ending that was supposed to come out. But because of the climate at the time, because so many people were dying, the director said, I can't put this out. He said, you know what, I got to put something out. I got to give people hope. So what he does is he puts his best friend at the very end, and he saves him. And Chris walks away to live another day free. There's a reality is that our story will change when glory shows up. And for many of us, we don't allow the glory to show up because we're saying, I've read this chapter before. I've seen this movie before. I know how it ends. And we begin to rehearse in our mind what has happened before. And because we keep rehearsing what happens before, what can happen won't happen because we keep rehearsing what has happened before. In the scripture today, or in this text that we looked at today, um, you guys are real familiar with Lazarus being raised from the dead. I know if you've been in church for at least two years, you've heard about six messages on this same thing. The reason why God keeps bringing this same thing up is because we keep rehearsing disappointment and not faith. So God has to keep bringing into your ear gate faith. He has to keep bringing stories up again and again. It's not because your preachers aren't aren't studying. It's not because they're not getting new revelation on different things that they're reading. It's because God is saying, my church is stuck. And the church is stuck because my people are stuck. And my people are stuck because they keep rehearsing the same thing. They don't always allow glory to show up. And if they do allow the glory to show up, we only show them half of what the problem is. He shows up and he says, uh, Jesus shows up after his friend had been dead for a couple of days. Now, if you know the backstory, when he finds out that his friend is dead, he stays where he is. He loves Lazarus, but he said he's got to stay dead. He's got to be good and dead. The reason why he has to be good and dead is because the whole book of John, there are seven major miracles that take place. And all of these miracles take place so that we will believe. That, that is the, per John says this in John 20 and 30, he says, and truly Jesus did many things, many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book, but these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing on him, you may have life in his name. That is the purpose of the book of John. So he does these miracles and he says this thing like I am, he says, I am the bread of life. And then he feeds 5,000. He says, I am the light of the world. And then he opens the eyes of the blinded mind, the blinded eyes. He, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. So something's got to die for him to prove that he is the resurrection and the life, right? My question to you today is, what did he say he was to you? 
and you know what he said based on what you're going through. So if you're dealing with sickness, he said that I am a healer. So now your expectation is you need to find healing in your story. But many of us won't find healing in our story because we feel like we've been dealing with the same thing over and over again. Or we find ourselves in lack. And because we've been in lack so long, we don't know how to move away from lack and live in overflow. So for four days, Lazarus is behind this grave, stone, dead. Mary's had, and Martha, they've been sleeping. They have friends there that have come to help have a pity party with them. If you read verse 37, it says that the people say, isn't this the same man that opened up the blinded eyes? Couldn't he have kept this man from dying? And we all have those friends in our lives. Jesus did it for them. What's going on with you? Well, that's their story. And I need to read their story to have a little bit of faith. But their story is not my story. And I don't know what they did in their story for glory to show up. See, glory changes the end of the story. Glory changes the entire story. Here's the thing. Many of us don't allow the glory to show up because we're like Martha. Martha says this. She says, there's a stone right there, and you told us to move it, but it smells behind there. The reality is she wasn't saying it, it smells behind there. What she was saying was, my disappointment is there. And I just got over being mad at you for not showing up when I needed you. Because I saw you heal this person. I heard you feed all these people. I heard about this miracle and that miracle. And in my story, there's a gravestone. So what should be a comma, I've made a period. What should be the next chapter, I just closed the book. Because I didn't like the way it ended. Here's the problem. If that's not the ending he showed you, that's not the end. And for many of us, the struggle is that we believe it's the end. And he's saying, no, it's just the beginning. See, I don't get to set you up until I put you down. I can't put you down low enough so everybody around you will step back and watch me show up. But because you want the glory, I don't get to show up in the story. So now you want everybody to come around you and cry and complain about, Jesus should have done this for, for you. You know, you, he stayed at your house, Martha and Mary, all this stuff. And, 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 and there's two ways to respond. You can respond like Mary because she heard Jesus was coming. She stayed home. Interesting, the person that acted like they were the closest to Jesus when they were in their house is not the same later. Because this is the same Mary that sat at his feet when he was in the house. And Martha was the one being busy. It's amazing what shows up when stress shows up. Because we talk about Martha being a busybody, but we didn't talk about Martha when she came to see him. At least she had enough sense to say, well, you didn't show up, and had you been here, he wouldn't be dead. And Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. And if you believe in me, You'll see it. Here's one of the issues with us. We don't believe what we saw. Let me say it again. We don't believe what we saw. What I'm saying is, is God showed you a picture and not you saw it, right? You saw it. But we don't believe it because we haven't seen it yet. So most Christians are from St. Louis. Show me. Show me. Ah, you got to show me. Don't just tell me, show me. And God's saying, I don't work like that. I need you to believe first. I need you to believe that I am who I say I am. You've got to believe me first before I will do it. And, and that's the, that becomes some of the issue for us is because we struggle with believing. Let's be honest. We, we struggle with believing. God, I saw you do this. I saw you do that. I've heard about you do this, but I don't know if you can do it for me. Because I don't feel I'm worthy. Because every time I look up, I'm reminded of this gravestone that's still there. So I don't want to deal with the disappointment. I don't want to deal with the fact that, Jesus, I just got over being mad at you. I just got over being hurt because you didn't show up. I just got over this. And now you want me to go and remove the gravestone? I don't know if I can do that. So we start trying to reason and rationalize why the impossible can't show up when the person who has the ability to do the impossible is there. So what we do is we'll say, well, he needed a healing. And I know you as a healer. So I know that you can do that. If he needed his eyes open, I know that you can do that because I heard you do that before. Because that's an aspect of your glory. Glory is simply this. It's just an aspect of God or his characteristics that, that you see. So I've seen you heal. 
I've seen you open blinded eyes. I've seen you feed a lot of people. I've seen or heard about you walking on water, but I haven't seen you bring somebody back to life. So my belief is constrained based off of what I've seen and heard you do. The thing is, is that eternity can't exist in time. And many times we try to have eternity exist in time, not understanding that because he exists outside of time, he's not bound by the same laws that we are, which basically means that even though it is dead to us in eternity, if he said it was going to be alive, it's alive. Now, here's the thing. Do you know how eternity gets into time? Obedience. That, that was my main point today. I'm going to read it to you because I wrote it down because I really spent a lot of time working on it. And, and it just simply says this. Our obedience is the bridge God uses to get his will done in the earth. You will find an abundance of miracles happening in an environment where our, where our obedience and faith are consistently exercised. So miracles don't show up until we're obedient because that's the bridge for it to take place. So a miracle shows up when he removes the stone. But they don't remove the stone so they don't get to see the miracle. Here's the crazy thing. If you go back and read the, the entire chapter, Jesus says this, the sickness is not unto death. That doesn't make any sense because we just read that he was dead. But Jesus said the sickness is not unto death. All right, you guys are familiar with the verse that says that, that he's not a man, that he should lie, that he's the son of man that he should repent. You know that, I believe that's in, uh, gosh, that's where Balaam, and, and, and you got that. And you got Jeremiah 12 and one, I believe it says that he, he, he sends out his word and he's watching the performance. And in Ezekiel, he says that whatever I said, I'm going to do. This basically means that if I said something, if he says something, now his word is out there. So healing is this mic stand. I'm right here. Jesus spoke it back there, which means that healing is right there. I've got to get to where the word is. So if the word is behind the stone or the answered prayer is behind the stone, then I have to remove the barrier keeping the prayer from being answered. Now, here's our part, because I know when we preach this, we don't always preach that you have a part to play. Jesus says, you move the stone. Why did he tell them to move the stone? Because they put the stone there. He didn't put the stone there. They put the stone there. And because they put the stone there, they're the ones that need to move it. God is not going to do what you can do. He's going to do what he can do. Which means that if I have an issue that I created, then I need to work on getting it fixed before he'll come up and do what he can do. Does that make sense? They put the stone there, so they need to move the stone. But on the other stone, behind the stone is their, their sickness. Because he's dead, he's been dead for a while, and, and it smells bad, and I don't want to look at disappointment. I don't want to look at the anger that I have towards you. Because I said earlier, I just got over being mad at Jesus. We all have been there, where he didn't answer our prayer the way we expected it to be answered. Or didn't do something and, and we're struggling like God you told me this I spent all this time with this person and they just did this and did that and 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 I'm disappointed I'm hurt I'm upset Drake said it best I'm upset uh, don't act like you don't listen to Drake saints I, I'm, 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 I'm irritated I'm mad they move the stone notice what they don't say there's no mention of the sin there's no mention of the scent. Why is there no mention of the scent? Because he's not dead behind the stone. And the reality is, is that the answer prayer is behind the stone. And if you remove the stone, then you can see the answer prayer. They move the stone. He comes out. He's bound. He's bound. And that's where many of us are right now. Our dreams, our expectations, we can see them, but they're not living the way we expected them to be. Because we've allowed people to place grave clothes on something living. Grave clothes are for the grave, but he's living. So it doesn't make any sense why something that is alive 
smells like death or has the, the, the appearance of death on it. Jesus says, loose him and let him go. And I, I struggled with that for a while because I was like, uh, what I know about you is when you went to the grave, the stone was moved and your grave clothes were all nicely folded up. How come you didn't do that for Lazarus? That it, anybody ever think like that? Like I saw the way you did it. He said, well, I'm not like you. You can't do what I can do yet. So what I need you to do is be willing to stop wrapping people in laws and traditions that you've placed on them and let them live. You know why most people won't show up at church? Because even though after Jesus made them alive, we leave them wrapped in grave clothes. We leave them wrapped up. We leave them wrapped up. And so we're walking around free, some of us. Some of us bound. And we've got a lot of dead things walking. A lot of dead things existing, but nothing really living. And so there seems to be a decline in, in, the, in the, the appearance of miracles in the earth because people only believe when they see a miracle. When they see a miracle, they say, if that kind of God can do it for you, I got to serve him. I, got, I, I have to serve the same God you're serving because your situation seems to be turning around. But the reality is that our situation doesn't always, always turn around because we've got a gravestone in front of it or we've got grave clothes on. So you're doing a little bit better than me and you go to church and you do all this and all that. And no, 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 no. I'm doing much better than you right now because glory is showing up in my story. So now they got to see Jesus a different aspect of his glory. They didn't just get to see the guy that can open up blinded eyes. They got to see some, bring someone back to life. Who serves that God? Who serves that God that can bring a dead thing back to life? He said it should be alive. Whatever God told you it's supposed to be. Now your job is to remove every barrier that is keeping it from being. And that means if God said your family should be healed, they should be saved, you have to remove the barrier. Here comes the critical issue. Some of us are the barrier. You are the stone. Why are you the stone? Because you have grave clothes on. So I saw a God do half of a miracle. Who wants half of a sandwich? When I told you you could have the store. So you're telling me I'm not dead, but I'm still dealing with this sickness. But your word said that I'd be healed. I'm in debt. You said I'd be the lender and not the borrower. And, and I know I've been trying to steward my money better. I've been doing what I'm supposed to do. This is what your word said. So how come I'm not seeing what your word said? Question, where is the glory in the equation? Because we'll stop when we start to see a little bit of success. I, I've done that. I lost a lot of, bit, a lot, a lot of weight. And, and I said I had a goal, and I'm literally 10 pounds away from my, my major goal. And I've been up this weight since probably about the last two months because I saw a little bit of success. I saw a little bit of success. And many of us would have stopped when the gravestone was moved away. Would have stopped right there. That, that, that's the end. Like, okay, he, he removed the gravestone, praise the Lord. But the quality of life that Lazarus has is not great. So he tells the people to loose him and let him go. Why do you say loose him and let him go? Why loose him and let him go? Why? Because we'll lose somebody but we'll keep reminding them about what they used to be. We'll keep reminding them. Hey Amen. remember you when you used to do this or that? Remember when you used to do this? He said, let him go. I don't need him to be reminded of what he used to be. He knows what I've done for him. So he says, let him go. Loose him and let him go. Let your dream, let that person, let that relationship live. 
Once God brings it back to life and you do the work of taking the grave clothes off, let it go. Because now it becomes a testimony. One of our issues is we don't like tragedy. And you shouldn't. You should look for triumph. But we get caught in the tragedy. And some of us have been singing the same thing over and over again, over and over. Anybody have a song they really, really like? And, and you like play that song all the time and just put it, like when they came out with repeat, automatic repeat, you just let that song keep playing, playing over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. And then you go to the concert and you hear it and there's a completely different version of the song. And your eyes open up like, where was this version at? And they're like, no, nah, the version came out a while ago. But you've been playing this other song on repeat over and over again. We have been doing the same thing in some of our situations, playing the same thing over and over again, over and over again, because we are comfortable in chaos. We prefer a familiar, unhealthy situation over having to exercise our faith in something unknown. And God is saying, I keep showing you a different aspect of my glory. I keep showing you something different because I want you to know me a little bit different. I want you to know all of me. But if I gave you all of me, I don't know if you could handle it. So just like Moses, he said, Moses, you can watch me walk by from behind. Because if you saw me in my full glory, it would kill you. Are we getting that? If you saw him in his full glory right now, it would kill you. Why? Because your body hasn't been glorified yet. So what he has to do is he has to just keep showing you a little bit at a time until now we look like him. Now we're glorified so I can handle the weight of your glory. But while I'm here on earth, you're keep, you keep trying to show me how big you are, how great you are, how amazing you are. And, and that means that in order for me to know how great you are or to know you as a healer, I've got to have a season where I'm sick. I have to have a season where I'm going through something that's not positive for a little while. I have to go through a season, not a lifestyle, a season of this. Seasons change. Seasons change. And if you're going through something over and over again and God is saying, I'm trying to put you in daylight savings time. I'm trying to give you a little bit more light, but you want to stay stuck right here because this is comfortable. He said, I can't show you my glory. I can't show up and change you and give you a different ending because you like the ending you have, or at least you're comfortable with it. Having to step out and walk on faith is pretty difficult for most of us. You know why? Because we like to dictate how it ends. We want to dictate, it's going to do this, it's going to do this, it's going to do this, and I'm going to do this, it's going to move like this. Like anybody rehearse a conversation? You rehearse a conversation, I'm going to say this, they're going to reply like this, I'm going to say this, then I'm going to snap my finger two times, stomp my foot, I'm going to do all of this stuff. You rehearse the conversation in your mind, and then you have the conversation, and it goes completely different. <laughs> completely different, like, I knew it was going to do this, I knew it was, and it's completely different. Do you know what the change factor was? Glory showed up and said, I can't end like that. It can't end like that. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but it can't end like that. It can't end like that. Let me tell you this. You have to go through issues. You have to go through seasons of lack. You have to go through all of these different seasons so that people will know that the God that you serve is who he is. You have to go through it. You, we, we're not honest with people. We're not honest with people. Me and my wife, we, we went out a little while ago. I'm going to share this because she's here. And I love you, woman. And I know where to go. <laughs> I know how far over the edge to at least look and then back up real quick. We, we, we go through seasons where, where I drive her crazy. I drive her crazy. Anybody who's dealt with me before know that I, I'm a little, I'm a dreamer. I am a dreamer. I'm telling you, I can see. I was like, God, I know what you showed me. I know what you showed me, and I start working on it a little bit, and then I move on to the next thing. I, that, that is my, my, my gift and my curse. I can see. I'm telling you, I can see. People are shaking their head because they know. So I drive my wife crazy, and sometimes she'll be like, why are you doing that? You, you, why didn't you do this? 
and 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 I was like, because it's you know, I don't know. I just saw something else. Like I saw something bigger and better show up, or I looked at it again, and then it should have been this. And I'm work on it for a little while, and then it just it just doesn't get done. And and what I found is that we have a generation of people that love to be inspired. We love to be inspired. I guarantee you. Open up your Instagram. See how many churches you follow. How many pastors you follow. How many motivational speakers you follow. You have all this motivation. You have all this inspiration and no action. So yes, Jesus, I believe that you can pull the man out of the grave. Move the stone. Move the stone? Nah. I'm just going to keep believing that you can do it. There's a thought when you, you, you read the verse that, that Jesus wept. There's a thought that says that it wasn't him weeping because of the people in the sense of because they were all down and discouraged. It's not why he was weeping. And, and I, I thought about it. I was like, that makes perfect sense. If he said that Lazarus was going to get up, he's not crying because the people are weeping. He told Martha, if you believe, you'll see the glory. He told Mary... Mary didn't believe. Notice who's not mentioned at the graveyard. Mary. There are going to be some people that hear about the glory. There are going to be some people that see the res resurrection and the life and miss the miracle. So could it be that Jesus was hurt because somebody he loved wouldn't be able to know him? the way he was trying to show himself. Could it be that Jesus is crying over you right now because you keep denying the ability he has to shift your situation? Could it be he's crying because someone has allowed the conversation and expectations of others to influence or retard your, your, your belief in what he can do. Healing doesn't need a resurrection. Death does. But death does. So where in your life is there something that's contrary to what the word is? So if you don't know your Bible, if you don't know what the Bible says, because that's God's word to you, if you don't know what it says, you don't know what you have access to. Here's what's interesting. Jesus does all of these miracles. All these miracles are recorded in John so that people would, it, it built the case to prove that Jesus was the Messiah crazy thing is, is that all of the Old Testament talks about what the Messiah would look like when he showed up. He would open blinded eyes. Check, he did that. He would open up deaf ears. Check, he did that. He would do crazy miracles, so he feeds all these people. He walks on water. Check, check, check. Got to the last one, no death. Very interesting that none of the Pharisees, none of the Sadducees said, he's checking all of these boxes. There's only one last one. He checks that box, and people begin to believe. God's trying to check a box in your life so that people would believe. Our responsibility is not just for our dreams to come alive. Our responsibility is to help those that are bound get free. You have to be willing to have callous hands and a soft heart. But many of us have callous hearts and soft hands. What does that mean? We're not willing to exercise and work our faith. We're willing to believe, but we're not willing to work. So there's a lot of dead faith in a lot of churches because nobody's willing to do the work. But if people would begin to do the work, miracles would start to show up. And you know what would show and trend on CNN? Another miracle happened at this church. Another miracle happened at this church. Another miracle happened at this. Man, they went to the hospital and people were just walking by, getting out of their beds because someone's shadow happened to show up. That, that's what shows up when we begin to exercise our faith and begin to be obedient. Now we create an environment for miracles to show up. So if you want to see things change, start being obedient. 
because obedience is the bridge that allows eternity to show up in our lives. And when eternity shows up, things start to shift. Here's the prayer. Jesus says, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that what he said? He said, let it be on earth. Before he goes on, he thanks his father, and he said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he goes on with the rest of his prayer. Here's the crazy thing that we miss. He's trying to get heaven and earth first because things line up in heaven, then they begin to line up in earth. And Jesus has crazy power, which means that I've allowed divinity to show up in a place that is lacking divinity. And when divinity shows up, now everything around it has to show up. You know why things happen in praise? Because if he inhabits the praises, I live in praise, and things can't be broken and messed up in praise. So why I show up in praise means that things line up. Anybody ever been in worship and you had like something going on with your leg or your arm or something like that, and you just begin to thank God and healing start to show up? You know why healing showed up? Because he showed up. Things don't stay dead when glory shows up in the room. And the crazy thing is, is that Lazarus was alive behind the stone and you would have never seen life show up unless you'd be willing to move the stone. So ma'am, sir, I don't know what you're dealing with in your life, but I can tell you this, if you're obedient to what he gave you and roll it all the way through, step A, two, three, do all of it, then you will see what he showed you. You'll see it. You'll start to see it again. I've been, there's a church up in, in, up in Northern California, and it was crazy because these people, I was like, man, they, they're wild. They wild, and they don't look like us. They are wild. I said, like, we always say, oh, we love worship. We love worship. Go to their church. Go to Bethel Church. Go up to Bethel. And, and they, they speak in tongues over there. They do all of this stuff that we say we like, but they do it for hours. For hours. It got so hectic there that they would go to the supermarket, grab the little thing, they, the intercom, and say, hey, if you're dealing with something, meet me on aisle six. There was lines of people showing up on aisle six, coming to aisle six one way, leaving a different way. Notice this wasn't happening at church. It got so crazy that they had, they had to hire a full-time historian to document all of the miracles taking place. Can I ask you a question? Why can't it happen here? Why can't that happen here? I've got that kind of faith to believe that, God, you can do it for me too. You didn't show me all of these miracles and scriptures just to believe for me. You showed me the miracle so I could believe for somebody else. And here is the thing that had me jacked up. I, I, I just, I, I, messed, I missed it. It was interesting that their faith wasn't, when they moved the stone, something that was talked about. It said that they just moved the stone. They were obedient. This leads me to believe that sometimes I don't always have to have faith. I just need to be obedient. I just, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you said do it. And because you said do it, I'm a little nervous about doing it. But I'm going to push the button because you said to push this button right here. I just want to make sure this is the right button to push. I don't know what's going to happen on the other side of the door, but I'm going to push the button. Where is that person at? Where is that person? Where, where are we at? that begin to see the miracles. I'm telling you, I feel a shift taking place and it's not one of those things where we say, oh, we're shifting so that a personality can go up. I feel a shift because God needs people to know who he is. He needs people to know who he is. We, we for so long have, have, have been like, well, why is the world messed up and why is this happening and why is this happening? Where is God? And God is saying it's doing exactly what I designed it to do, decay. And the people that have the ability to speak life need to open up their mouths. I designed the world to decay so that they would know that they needed a savior. So I've allowed things to get crazy bad so that when you show up, things start to change. So we can't be surprised that things are falling apart, but we can't keep silent while they fall apart. Because what we're doing is we're co-signing on something that we're against. And it's not until you walk in the hospital and say, you need to get up out of the bed that things begin to change. And we have to be honest with ourselves and with each other. That's when life changes. That's when obedience begins to, to, to bring heaven to earth. 
I need an environment of healing around me. I need an environment of prosperity. I need an environment of overflow around me. So I've got to continue to be obedient over and over again until now I'm one of those people that walk in victory. I don't have victory sometimes. I'm walking in victory consistently. Things change when I show up in the room because my obedience is there. Things start to shift when I show up in the room. When we show up in the room, things shift. There should be a major shift when anytime somebody from this church shows up together at a location. And people say, man, my back was hurting. I don't know what just happened. You'd be like, oh, it was me. It was me. It was me. The God in me. It was me. It was me. It was him. It was him. Let me tell you why your situation changed. God said something about this, this, that, and the other. And because I showed up in the room and I was obedient here, that's why the situation changed. Obedience is the key. But here's the problem with obedience for us. I'm getting ready to close. Come on, Josh. I always like to, you know, I like when they mess with him. Come on, son. <laughs> Our obedience is a process. It's a process. And because we're a generation of people that have grown up on microwave popcorn, hot pockets, Instant gratification. Only denied on Sunday when Chick-fil-A is closed. It's the only time you've got to exercise some obedience. Or discipline, rather. Because we've gotten used to things happening right away, we have an expectation that when we pray, things shift immediately. Everything changes. As soon as I, I pray, God, God's handled it. And he has handled it. But if you don't remove the obstacles to allow what happened over here to attract itself to you. It's the crazy thing is that the word, miracles are attracted to obedience. They're attracted to each other. But because we're not willing to always go through all of the steps we miss things. Things look disjointed. I, I am a, uh, I am not a handy person at all. At all. My wife will tell you I am not handy. I will get a box of something and I have extra screws and things left over. It'll say seven screws on the thing. I end up with three extra ones. I told my wife, I was like, they did that because they knew some people would lose some. I just happened to be good enough not to lose all of mine. She said, no, I don't think that's going to work. I don't think that's going to work. And that's been us. That's a lot of us in this room. We saw the stone be moved away. We saw that. We, we see our dream. We see our vision. We see, we see eternity wrapped up. We see whatever God promised us wrapped up. And because it doesn't look the way we thought it was going to look, we let it stay there. Who around you is missing an opportunity to know God because of our lack of obedience? Who on the earth is missing out on the great things that God has for them? Who's being delayed? The amazing thing that God has for them because of your lack of obedience. We try to put everything on God and God is saying, nah, nah. I did my part. Did you do your part? Did you do what I told you to do? I don't know what is unfinished but my assignment this morning was to remind you to loose it and let it go. Everybody standing. I'm getting ready to pray. It, it's, it's not over. It's not over. Look at the person next to you say, it's not over. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. 
it's not over, it's not over, it's not over. Find somebody else, say, it's not over, it's not over, it's not done, it's not, it's not over for you. The glory will change your story, it will. Every eye closed. Lord, we love you and we thank you for speaking to us this morning. God, we thank you that in every area that is contrary to what your word says, that we've been reminded today that it can and it should change. So our prayer right now, Father, is that we be obedient to what you're saying. Whatever instruction that you gave us, that we complete the task. Father, today, do grace by us. We're getting ready to walk into this. We're in this holiday season, and there are some men and women that have to see a miracle. There are some men and women that have to see a sign. They've got to see a wonder, Father. And we are that answer. We are the answer. Say, I'm the answer. I am the answer. We are the answer to the questions that they have. So our prayer today, Father, is that we be willing to respond and show up where you need us to show up, Father. For that, we give you the glory. For that, we give you the honor. For that, we give you all the praise. And it's in Jesus', Jesus mighty name. Amen. Amen. I, I just, I don't feel a push to do an altar call today because you guys got an assignment to go do. What's my assignment? What's my assignment? I'm reading a book called The Four, Four Disciplines of Execution. Like I said before, we are inspiration junkies. We love inspiration. We love to be inspired, the new and shiny thing. Not today. Go execute. I can't tell you what God told you to do. I, I don't have that gift. I wish I did. I don't, I don't have that gift. I can't tell you what God told you to do. But you know what he told you to do. And the question today that you have to answer is, God, do I want the glory to change the story? Or am I comfortable with this ending? Do I want something different? Do I want something different? You got to ask yourself that question. You got to wrestle with that. And once you make up in your mind that you want something different, do what is necessary to see a different ending. God will do it for you. Amen. Amen. We're going to go ahead and get ready to go home. Um, this is what I need you to do. We say this all the time. We always say, man, go invite somebody to church, invite somebody to church, invite somebody to church. Don't invite nobody to church. I don't want you to invite somebody to church. I want you to share your faith with someone this week. I want you to share something good about God this week. That's what I want you to do. I don't want you to invite anybody to church. I want you to go share something good that God is doing. I want you to inspire somebody this week. That's what I'm looking for you to do. Because what will happen is someone will follow you back. Someone will follow. We keep trying to get people to come to church. They're not coming to church yet. So God sent us to them. You create the environment for a miracle. Amen. Amen. We're in time to go ahead and get brunch. Amen. I don't get to eat till later. Amen. We thank God for his grace and his ability to do amazing things. Amen? Amen. Look at four people around you say, go finish it. Go finish it. Four people around you. Four people around you say, go finish it. Go finish it. Amen. If you'd love to be a part of our church, we'd love for you to partner with us and do amazing things. If that's you, you don't have a church home, you've been going, hanging out with us. You know, you show up so much that we actually think you're a member. You're really not. I need you to go ahead and make that commitment, put a ring on it. You know, we're not hypocrites. You are and misery loves company. So come hang out with us. We're going to do amazing things. If you'd like to join, you want, oh, come on, God's girl. You'd like to join? Come on up. Amen. All right. I thought she was a member. Anybody in the balcony want to join today? Amen. You a member already. Amen. All right. Good stuff. It's been amazing hanging out with you. I hope this helped you today. Amen. God, we thank you for your presence in this place and what you've allowed us to experience. As we leave this place, Father, we take your presence with us and expect things to line up with what we know about you. 
and things we don't know about you. We expect them to line up. We give you the praise for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday.